Hello and welcome to today's cut. Today we will be talking about right hook, cut the crap. That's the title of today's episode. I'm happy to join you uh, today. My name is John Nelson. I'm the technology evangelist for Three Lines Publishing, and I'm joined with a trio of very talented individuals here at Three Lines. Carlos Leva, the CEO of um, Three Lines Publishing. Deborah Leva, the Director of Business Development here at Three Lines, and last but not least, Martin Gwen, our Director of Operations. So let's get right down to it. Uh, Carlos, cut the crap. That's today's topic. And uh, first off, what does cut the crap mean? What? Yeah, so it really should be cut the hippo crap, and we just kind of left that out of there. And I think Martin's going to change the name to cut the hippo crap. And it's got to do with a um, a series of emails and posts that I've been doing to try to clarify some of the things that's bugged me about the HIPAA marketplace for a long, long time. A lot of the snake oil that's uh, being sold out there. And so I'll give you an example, but I don't want to sort of run the table on the first question. Um, there are, you know, and obviously, you know, we have Espresso and we have our subscription plan and, you know, this is not about that, but, you know, just, you know, full disclosure, when we talk about competitors, I'm not going to be naming names, I don't believe in, in doing business that way, but we got a lot of competitors that will sell what they call a risk assessment and it's nothing but a questionnaire or a survey, okay, now, you might you might be conned into believing that that is an acceptable risk assessment, but in fact, what HHS has uh, endorsed um, implicitly, if not expressly, is the NIST methodology for conducting a risk assessment that's captured in NIST um, SP 800-30 Rev 1, which is you know the risk assessment standard that that um, express so embodied where you have threats and, and vulnerabilities combined and you have to multiply, multiply that times an impact, you get a risk and, and so forth, right? And so, uh, you know, it's caveat emptor. I don't believe that these other things are going to pass at the end of the day for uh, a valid risk assessment. I believe that the HHS will ultimately say, you know, Yes, you're free to choose a methodology. They made that clear in recent guidance, and that recent guidance was really, you could write Expresso. It could have been an Expresso data sheet. It's, it says, do it this way, right? Um, and so I, I think the message between the lines, and not so subtly, is, yes, you're free to do something uh, that's not exactly like this, but you know what? It ought to be as good as this or better. Okay, and uh, uh, so if, if you believe you've done a valid risk assessment because a vendor has given you a, a list of 300 questions to answer, then you probably are, um, you know, first of all, you probably misspent a lot of money because they used that risk assessment, quote unquote, to sell you something else. And uh, you could be hit with a willful neglect fine because almost everything in the security rule depends on doing a valid risk assessment. So that's an example of, um, you know, cut the crap. There's lots of others. I'll give you one more. And, you know, I got a, obviously a whole list here, but there are vendors that are now selling um, $100,000 insur breach insurance policy. In case you get breached, if you buy their products, you have a, you get a $100,000 policy now. There's a group called the Ponymon Institute, or Ponymon, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but it's, they've been doing these um, sort of surveys about what it costs for a breach, I, I think for about seven or eight years now. Okay? And every year, it seems, their estimate of the per record cost for healthcare goes up $100. So I remember when they said it was 200 then 300 and this year it's 400 And you can just do some simple math. Let's say you had a really, really small breach, given the amount of information you can uh, put on the thumb drive today, let alone a phone or a laptop or 
a PC, let's just use a thumb drive. If you have a breach of 5,000 records, which you know by today's standard would be a really, really small breach, times $200, that's a million dollars cost right there in fines. And you know, yes, they say that they include reputation, and it's really, it's really confusing as to what the other numbers are. But that's a million dollars if you used their number three years ago. All right, if you use their number now, that's two million dollars. That's for a very, very small breach. You got Panaman Institute, um, but you know, essentially um, selling fear. I don't really believe. I believe it's expensive, and I believe it's going to ruin your day. But I don't believe these. I didn't believe the two hundred dollar number. I don't believe the four hundred dollar number. I don't really believe in 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 selling fear. It is expensive, and it is going to ruin your day. And we know it can ruin your reputation. Look at what happened at Tar the Target, and they got the CEO got whacked because of it. And it's going to have dire consequences, right? But uh, you know, but selling fear. Those numbers are. They just seem absurd on their face. They're going out of business numbers, and I don't see anybody that's going out of business because of a breeze. I'm, I'm going to stop right there to catch my breath and let you guys digest all that if you can follow the thread. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it, so it seems like Cut the Corrupt is uh, perhaps not aggressive uh, per se, but certainly more pointed and direct than a lot of uh, a lot of other speak that's going on in terms of HIPAA compliance. So why why have you cho chosen to um, go that way to be so direct with it? Well, because we've been teaching thousands of people now, thousands in, over the last seven years with our you know webinars that are are are, um, are well attended. Usually we get between seventy and a hundred people and you know, um, a monthly newsletter, and we have sold thousands of products that have helped people, and yet, you know, there's so much myth-making out there that still remains regarding HIPAA compliance that, you know, it's, it's, there's so much noise, it's hard for any signal to break through, and now there's lots of reasons for the, there's lots of reasons for the noise, it seems like every other day, a new HIPAA consultancy or vendor, you know, is popping up and saying, you know, hey, we got the, we got the stuff, you know, to help you or comply and, you know, one, two, three easy steps or four, five, six easy steps, and you know, so I've taken the challenge in some of that because it, it seems like with respect to HIPAA, the myths just don't die; they just keep, they just keep you know, promulgating, man. It's like they keep rising from the dead, and it's the same thing over and over. So uh, this is an attempt to try to uh, get some signal through uh, all the noise that's out there. There's more and more noise every day, and I believe in part it's working, taking some of these controversial positions, I think, has started more conversations, uh, and it has made people uh, at least sit up and take notice and think about what it is they're doing with their with their HIPAA compliance initiatives. For example, you know, you should be prepared to ask a vendor, what's your compliance methodology? That's a fair question. If you get the deer in the headlights, look, well, then that ought to concern you. You ought to be prepared to ask your HIPAA vendor, you help me cover all 169 requirements that the HHS identified in its uh, phase one audit protocol. It actually it actually identified more in phase two because they, they counted it different. But you know, again, they, you know, you, you need a HIPAA vendor that's helping you with all three rules: the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule. Not just one rule, not just part of a rule, right? So you need, and the consuming public, for lots of different reasons. Some of them historical or just not that aggressive. They just think that it's the old HIPAA with a new twist, which meant all they needed to do was fill out some paperwork and some templates and things like that, and they were good to go. Okay, and that's clearly not the case. High tech was meant to change all that. It was meant to increase the, uh, the amount of fines, and it did. It was meant to give OCR more enforcement authority. It was meant to give the state AGs more enforcement authority, and frankly, a lot of this cut the crap mythology that has uh, persisted 
is is we can lay at the hands and at the feet of OCR because they've been lax in their in, in their enforcement and, and and you know it's it's not quite the dead letter it was before high tech where the dirty little secret was you could ignore HIPAA except for maybe the notice of privacy practices because it wasn't enforced. Not the case now. The big difference is the 800 pound gorilla breach notification, which if you have a breach, you know, of over 500 records, uh, then you're going to wind up on the HHS Hall of Fame. You're going to get it audited by definition. And so that was the game changer. But outside of, outside of breach, you know, H OCR has really, really been lax to say the least. And, and, and it's enforcement and it's proactive enforcement activities and it's really surprising because the high tech act said any fines that were generated would return back to HHS coffins for more enforcement and I, I think I re recently looked at a number that uh, they've gener generated I believe since the high tech act 45 million in fines now you know I know the government is not the most in efficient player in the marketplace, but it would just seem to me, um, you know, as an attorney and an entrepreneur, that $45 million would buy you, you know, some enforcement. So, I, you know, I would question where does all this money go, all right, and what is this, what is this, you know, here we are in 2016, and uh, OCR's idea of being aggressive is they're going to do 200 desk audits uh, to uh, BAs. And a recent number of total number of BAs, okay, and these numbers are, need to be validated, but they were HHS's numbers, okay, were 167,000 total business associates. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Not 167,000. That the average was 167 per covered entity. That every covered entity, on average, had 167 business associates. So. They're going to do 200 desk audits. That's barely doing the business associates. Uh, that's barely asking for information regarding business associates of one covered entity. Carlos, when when you talk about OCR and and their desk audits, what types of issues do you do you see that they're finding in any of these audits or in prior case histories related to HIPAA? Well, it's not. It's not clear to me yet because I don't, I don't know if we've seen the result of the desk audits. They're, they're you know, as per their phase two protocol, they're asking pretty probing questions and requiring that the people that do get audit respond with a significant amount of documentation. Okay, so the desk audits themselves are serious. I mean, you know what I mean? You're, you're, any, anybody that gets hit with one. Uh, is going to spend a lot of time responding and may rue the day because quickly the first thing they ask for is a risk assessment, you know, for the security rule, and then, then they go on for there, from there, and they, you know they're auditing not just the security rule but pieces of the privacy rule and some breach notification stuff uh, as well. But they're not auditing uh, in phase two. I don't think they. I think they cut it back and they say they didn't say all 169 requirements that. Uh, uh, that were identified in phase one, but enough of them, enough of them, all right? And, and so uh, we've yet to see the, re we've yet to see the results. I think the, I think the covered entities, uh, I can't remember, maybe started sometime this summer, uh, but that's the other thing. It takes, it takes OCR like two years to complete one of these investigations. And the premise is that if they see some kind of willful neglect in what they get back from the desk audit, then that will trigger a full audit, okay? Um, and I understand that, o that OCR wants to be thorough and fair, but taking two years to complete an investigation, think of it this way. The population of covered entities and business associates that they're attacking is so small that it's not fair to the rest of the covered entities and the business associates that have tried to comply because this is not just a, you know, uh, necessary evil anymore. This has been, cybersecurity has been identified as something that's uh, mission critical to the national defense of the United States of America, okay? And security is only as good as your weakest link. And in the healthcare industry, we got literally thousands, maybe millions of weak links. And OCR has kind of been sitting on a fan saying, uh, well, you know, 
I mean, for the first five years, they were like, well, we're just going to do what, you know, regulatory agencies do. We're going to educate the marketplace and slow walk and blah, blah, blah. The OIG kind of got on their case and said, you guys aren't enforcing this the way you're supposed to, especially with respect to small players. And then they stepped it up. But they're step, you know, stepping it up is these desk audits. You know, I mean, what, desk audits, with $45 million, why don't you hire a 1,000 interns and go do 10,000 desk audits? That would send a message that we're coming after you and that everybody's got to get better. Well, the, uh, in terms of, of the desk audits, they don't even have to hire the interns. They just have to put them out and then review them at their leisure. So it, it, to me, it, I just think the next net that goes out there is going to be much, much wider. Well, it's not. It's not right now, but I, I would say hire 10,000 interns because you, you do want to review them. You don't want to review them at your leisure. There is some expectation that you're going to review them in some responsive way. My point is two years does not appear to be responsive. You know, and some of these, some of these you could find willful neglect probably you know, with with a three week investigation, not a two year investigation, and uh, you know, it's just, it's mind boggling why it takes so long to get, um, you know, uh, to do the. I, I understand that they're trying to be fair to the organization, but two years is a long time to turn around something like this. Where I think, in many many cases, you you know, OCR should be finding willful neglect on its face. So it's you know, I, I question its entire approach uh, and, and that's why uh, although there have been move, there has been movement in the marketplace you can tell it anybody that, that, that plays in this space knows that there's been movement but uh, but not nearly enough and there probably won't be until OCR does something uh, significantly different you mentioned that um one of the first questions that you'd be asked in, in a desk audit, or maybe probably a full audit as well, would be, um, have you done your first risk assessment? So why does compliance start with a risk assessment? Is it just that you can't mitigate what you don't know, uh, what you haven't uh, identified yet, or does it go further than that? No, it's primarily exactly that. How are you going to How are you going to mitigate what you don't know? Right? How, it's kind of like how are you going to ma how are you going to manage what you don't measure? It's almost it's almost impossible, right? Because you don't know. You haven't the foggiest idea. And so the rest of the security rule is kind of presumes that you've done a risk assessment, and I, I, not not all of it, but a lot of it falls out of or is built upon that foundation. Your risk mitigation program assumes that you've done a risk assessment and then you've simplified and then you selected what controls you were going to attack and then you monitor and then you report and then you do another risk assessment, right? I mean, Espresso is built to help you quickly identify all those 29 controls uh, in the security rule that need to be implemented, right? And if you're doing a risk assessment and not identifying controls to implement, then you got to ask yourself, well, 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 what are you doing? Because whatever it is you're doing might help you improve your security against the bad guys, but it ain't helping you comply with the security rule. And yeah, you kind of want to do both, but you don't want to miss these 29 foundational controls that you need to implement. And that's in fact what they are. They're, you know, in today's uh, day and age, those controls identified in the security rule, both addressable and required are nothing more than IT 101. Now, I get that IT 101 is pretty, it's non-trivial for an ambulatory practice with, you know, a few docs, you know, a few nurses and an admin, but still, everybody needs to realize that that's just the cost of doing business today. You can't stick your head in the sand and say, we're going back to, you know, the good old days when everybody was on paper and we didn't have this breach nonsense. We're not going back. I mean, cybersecurity is not going away, right? It's it's part now, part now of you know the the mission critical to the national defense of the United States of America. It's one of the top one or two problems uh, that uh, the next president is going to have to address. We all we hear, you know, we hear all kinds of reports of Russians hacking us, us hacking the Russians. That's just not going to stop. Right, so this is not this is not a fad that's going to go away. Now, I do believe 
I do believe that there's a generational problem here. I believe that the old docs, because they didn't have to comply with HIPAA, it was HIPAA, SMIPA, don't bother me with this crap. You know, I'm a trained doctor, I save lives, I don't have time for Big Brother and all this bullshit, okay? The younger docs, they kind of get it. They were born digital, you know? They, 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 they may not like it, but they understand, they at least understand that the world has changed and they just can't, you know, do business the way they used to do business, right? And it's, I mean, we have to understand that really, until the High Tech Act and meaningful use, only about 5% of healthcare providers we're on electronic health records. Now that number is much larger, and obviously then the problem grows because you got this all this EPHI that you've got to protect. But you, we, we have to keep in mind that that change has occurred, you know, mostly within the last five, six, seven years. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a huge change. The ones that uh, were on electronic records before um, HIPAA came along, those records weren't adequately protected to begin with. So they, they, they're sitting there looking at and I hope they're getting the message they have to be protected. I don't know if they are. I think well, that's likely true. Yeah, that's likely true. I mean, because, um, yeah, I mean, there wasn't that much talk about, you know, enforcement of HIPAA, and so they, they, they weren't worried about it as much. You didn't hear about these major breaches. And, you know, now a lot of the EHR vendors are guerrilla companies that didn't exist before. and. You know, most of their services are on the cloud, so they're doing a much better job on security. But, you know, that, that, that that's only a small piece of the puzzle, you know, and that, that's another one of those cut the crap, you know, where uh, product vendors say that our products are HIPAA compliant, where no product, Espresso uh, and any other product you can think of that touches HIPAA can advertise as being HIPAA compliant because the only... HIPAA compliance only pertains to covered entities and business associates. There's no certification body that says, you know, this is a HIPAA compliant product. You know, like the FDA might for a drug, right? There's no agency that does that. You can't, you can't make that claim. And I recently called a vendor out um, on LinkedIn. I said, look, this is crap. You got to stop doing that. You're just confusing the marketplace. And the response was, well, yeah, but all my competitors are also doing it, and so I feel compelled to do it, or I'm sort of, you know, cheating my own employer. And, you know, and I actually have some empathy with that, with that position, because I've, if I was that marketeer, I, I probably would do it as well. But the FTC could come out and say, you know what, issue a warning, there are no HIPAA compliant uh, or OCR could do it. There are no HIPAA compliant products. Stop advertising. Uh, I say the FTC because it's the FTC that controls false advertising and not OCR. So OCR wouldn't have jurisdiction. But the FTC can come out and say, hey, as a guidance, do not advertise HIPAA compliant products because there's no such thing. Uh, they would clean all that up in the New York second, right? They, I mean, it, it, it just would over overnight that would be cleaned up. So there's so much sort of literacy that's required and it's not it's not getting done until we get basic literacy around HIPAA, until we cut the crap and, and break through all the myths uh, around it. Uh, you know, for you know, for example, if, if going back to how you comply, you could then this holds true for any regulatory scheme. If you're not complying at the granularity level of a requirement, then you're not complying, period. Okay? If you don't have policies, procedures, and tracking mechanisms to track process results at the granularity level of a requirement, then you don't have visible demonstrable evidence that you complied with that requirement. You can't have this sort of, I comply with HIPAA at, at some abstract level. It, it doesn't work that way. No regular regulatory scheme works that way. Right, so one of the things you ought to ask your vendor is, okay, which requirements do you help me comply with? I want you to tell me, right? And that presumes that you've identified the requirements. Now, we weren't surprised when HHS came out, when came out with their uh, OCR audit protocol because our products had already broken down the rules into their requirements, right? That was the whole underlying thinking around the security rule checklist, the privacy rule checklist, and in a slightly different way, the breach notification framework, 
right, was to cover all the requirements. And it turns out that when OCR came out and said, here are the requirements, they did nothing more but actually just list the requirements or enumerate them. Now, it's not just like you go out to the rules and you count them. You have to have some, some thinking goes into uh, extracting what is a requirement from everything else. And you're making some uh, judgment calls, right? And in the case of uh, three lines and espresso in our subscription, it was lawyers that were, that were making that, that, those judgment calls as to what a requirement is. So, for example, that's another kind of cut the crap thing is you can't have HIPAA consultants going around telling people whether or not they're legally in compliance, right? Because that's the unauthorized practice of law. That's only the purview of lawyers that can give you a legal opinion as to whether or not you're in compliance. Now, a technical consultant can help you implement encryption. They can be knowledgeable of the rules and say, this is my interpretation of what the rules say. What they can't say is, after we're done, you're going to be legally in compliance. They just can't do that as a, as a matter of law. So uh, to play devil's advocate here, we, we've discussed at, at some length the, uh, the pervasiveness of snake oil in the marketplace and uh, claims that may or may not be backed up. So what makes the HIPAA Survival Guide and Expresso and, and all the products that come with uh, our subscription, I believe it's over 30 now, what makes them not snake oil? What makes them legitimate and separates them from the competition? Well, that's a great question because that's what I've been expecting somebody to call me out on and ask me exactly that, right? So, first of all, Espresso uh, encompasses the NIST standard methodology for doing a risk assessment, right? So we pair um, threats and vulnerabilities and we allow you to calculate risk the way NIST says. We also, we also implicate, and by implicate I mean attach to one or more risks, all 29 controls identified in the security rules. So after you do a risk assessment with Espresso, you've identified the, all the controls that you need to uh, remediate in order to comply with the security rule. And if you remediate all those 29 controls, then by definition, you're in compliance. So from a mathematical perspective or a logical perspective, you can think of Espresso as being a tautology. It's true by definition, it's true by its very form because of the way we approached it, we purposely identified controls, the security rule controls that would be attached to risk. And, uh, and one of the ways that we were able to do that and not deal with 400,000 or 4 million risks that you, the threats that you may find out there in the wild, like in, in X4, IBM's X4 database is we did what what uh, NIST recommends is that you aggregate risk. Now we aggregated risk in the form of aggregating threats. So, for example, instead of having four hundred thousand vectors potentially uh, that could lead to to breaking into your network, we said social engineering or intrusion was a threat. Now that's an aggregation. That social engineering or intrusion probably embodies over a million threats in the wild and growing every day. But that was the only way we could, we, we or anybody else could come up with something that was manageable, right? And and this less that. So we we productize the standard essentially so our customers can rest easy uh, with respect to that. And then our other products help you remediate in significant ways. Like for example the privacy rule checklist goes through every single requirement of the privacy rule. Well, you can look at that requirement. We have a scorecard as well. And you can say, do I have a policy? Well, we give you a policy. Do I have processes? Well, we give you suggested processes that you should implement for this requirement. And do I have uh, the ability to track process results? Well, we give you suggestions as to how to do that. In some cases, we give you tools. But you can walk down and say, Am I in compliance with this requirement? So that's one of the things that we've done is we've identified the requirements um, at, the, at the proper level of granularity, at the level of a requirement. Okay, that's the only level you can possibly comply. So if someone asks us, well, how do we know that you're helping us comply? Uh, we can say, well, we've covered all the requirements in the privacy rule. In the privacy rule checklist, you can go through one by one and then 
go check the scorecard. We did the same thing for the security rule, go one by one. Yes, we aggregate a little bit. We don't have the numbers don't exactly match because we did some interpretation. But the, but the basis, the foundational basis in the methodology was correct, okay, as far as identifying all the requirements and providing uh, coverage. And it turns out the breach notification framework, uh, what it requires is preparation for a breach. So do you have a methodology that shows you when breach is triggered? You have model letters to patients. You have model letters to HHS. You know when HHS should be notified. You know when major media should be notified, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we can point to we can point to the tools uh, within our toolbox within those 30 products that help you remediate. Do they remediate everything? No. But first of all, we can show you quickly how far out of compliance you are by doing a risk assessment in three hours or less, and then give us another 15 minutes uh, after you've done that, and we can show you just how far we can get you from zero to 90 with our products that help you remediate. And we've, we've proven that we could do that with clients. And first of all, we've, we've touched the market and we've helped clients do that. Second of all, it, it was always intended, the subscription and express, it was always intended as a DIY, a, a, a DIY, do it yourself. And most customers do exactly that. So they, they don't need professional services to get that, the, the value out of the products. Um, I talk to a lot of customers, and one of the things I hear all the time is the cost that they're dealing with policies and procedures in, in the 30 plus products we've produced over the, the last seven years. They come with policies and procedures where you can customize those to your organization. Well, exactly, right. You don't have to re reinvent the wheel. We give you a privacy rule policy. It comes right out of a checklist security rule policy, a breach notification policy, a cloud policy, a social media policy, a mobile policy. Uh, you know, so we're giving you not only templates, but we're giving you a way to think about compliance so that you can change your organizational DNA in a way that will help you establish a culture of compliance. Ultimately, that's what HHS would like to see, right? If they come and audit you, and they find that you're dealing with a very rigorous methodology and you're trying to establish a culture of compliance and you've got this process that you're going through and you're doing risk assessments, you're not likely to be found in willful neglect and you're probably likely to get praised for what you're doing. Short of, you could be doing all that and have a major breach and then all that goes out of the window, right? Now, that's those are two separate things, but, you know, you... you, you, you the, having a major breach is just the beginning of your nightmare because you know HHS is going gonna, is gonna to show up and then you need to answer all these questions that most organizations, large and small, are not prepared to answer, especially about the methodology that they used to actually conduct uh, and to actually uh, jumpstart um, their HIPAA compliance initiative. So what, so what you're saying, Carlos, is that the the products and services, or the products and policies, procedures, et cetera, that are on the HIPAA survival guide, including include the risk mitigation piece, which is huge for Expresso, and being able to determine what your risk points are. And those would lead you to the products on the mitigation side of the house on the HIPAA survival guide, where you have products that can help you with the policies and procedures and checklists to be able to identify where are what you can do about providing a mitigation for a risk that you have identified within risk assessment. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean we help you with a lot of the remediation. We got uh, over I think 15 training products. We're about to issue a certification product so you can get all your people trained. You can get your um, policies and procedures customized and issued and have your staff sign them, um, you know, right away. Um, we give you a methodology for model letters and all that stuff for dealing with the requirements to come out of the uh, uh, breach notification audit protocol, a, a way of an analytical framework of knowing when uh, breach is triggered. In other words, 
we don't deliver every piece of re remediation. That would be impossible. I mean, some, some of the security rules says implement software that helps you deal with, you know, implement controls that help you deal with malicious software, right? Or implement a, a full-blown disaster recovery plan. Now, you know, with respect to the latter, we ha we're actually working on a template that's going to help you with a disaster recovery plan. We don't have one right now. Uh, we're actually uh, going to release in the next um, week or so, hopefully, two more model documents, a model document for asking for when patients ask for amendments to their PHI, um, uh, a model document when they ask for an accounting of disclosures of their PHI. And those are model documents that are added to the privacy rule checklist that our subscribers just get for free. We're also adding um, a training spreadsheet that keeps track of when your people were trained and which one of the five categories. Now, we, have, we actually have, uh, we've combined the audit, because the, the audit um, training products probably don't need to be um, taken by the uh, security officer and the privacy officer, but we have training for um, breach notification, we have training for the privacy rule, we have training for the security rule, we have training for the High Tech Act, and we have training for how to conduct an audit. Okay. And these, and, these are online training that they get with their subscription? They get all this with their subscription. Everything that we're okay. talking about, everything that we're talking about right now, they get with their subscription. And each training module has a quiz of 20 questions and and the answer key. So a privacy officer uh, can administer that test. You get a 70, you get a passing score. If you don't get a 70, you watch the video again and take take the test again. Right? It's kind of an open PowerPoint sort of way to go about it. But you know, there, there's um, we have a roadmap for remediation built into the product. It was totally intended to do uh, do it yourself, except we recognize that sometimes customers need a little bit of help. And then uh, the Digital Business Law Group, from a legal perspective, can go in there and sort of help them navigate and get them uh, jump started, which we've done recently with a particular client. and. Um, and in about 10 hour, 10 to 12 hours, they were way up the literacy curve. Part of that is that just doing a risk assessment through Espresso forces you up that literacy curve because it forces you to deal with this concept of a risk assessment that's really, really an abstraction, a complete abstraction until you start actually touching it and feeling it and doing it, which, uh, which, which Espresso enables you to do almost right away. So it seems like a big part of this of this value isn't just that it helps with actually complying with uh, with the HIPAA and high tech regulations, but also uh, the speed at which uh, at which you can climb up that curve. Because although it's it's a generic statement to say that we live in a fast paced world, but it's a generic statement because it's a true one, and everyone is pressed for time. So being able to save that time seems uh, like I wouldn't say just as important as actually complying, but certainly a uh, a large factor. So yeah. let's uh, let's talk about cost. Uh, now again, we're we're not going to um, you know dive in you know competitor by competitor here, but um, how does these uh, HIPAA survival guide relate in cost? Because there was one customer of ours where uh, I believe I believe his organization spent over four hundred thousand dollars on one vendor to assist them with their HIPAA compliance initiative. And at the end of that $400,000, they weren't really much further along. So how does the survival guide compare? Right. So, you know, we're not, first of all, we're not trying to do bait and switch, right? We're not trying to do a product. We're not trying to look like we're selling you a product. And what we really want to sell you is fear and complexity so that you buy a bunch of our professional services and end up paying us $400,000, right? Uh, we do have a vehicle to sell some professional services, and we will help you uh, if 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 requested. But uh, generally, it starts with a, a jump start from the Digital Business Law Group that is uh, $2,500 for 20 hours. And if you do the math, that's about as cheap as lawyer lawyers rates get. So our subscription is $2,500, but it's not $2,500 like per person. Right? There's some vendors out there that look really cheap, but then when you dig a little bit deeper, assuming that you can figure out their pricing from their website, and their website don't, doesn't just say 
oh, uh, yes, you know, you, you, go, you go and try to figure out what their product does, and you can't figure it out, right? Because there's no demos, what they say is contact us for a demo. I mean, there's no videos, they, you know, they're hiding the ball, right? And the same thing for pricing. So there's some vendors that look really, really cheap, but they only look cheap because if you're talking about a small ambulatory practice and they got five users, well, then maybe it costs you, you know, uh, $300 a year or, you know, $700 a year. But if that same product was sold to an organization of 1000 it might cost you $70,000 a year. So we feel like at $2,500, right, people are buying this without even calling our uh, inbound salespeople. They're buying it just organically off the web because at $2,500, including Espresso and plus our 30 products that keep growing and improving, they can't touch that anywhere in the marketplace. Okay, and they, they, yeah, that's one of the pieces of snake oil that I I'm sort of want to cut the crap about is, is is our competitors seem like they're more interested in hiding the ball than it's really explaining to people what it is that they should be doing to comply. Now, we've been teaching people, I personally have taught thousands and thousands of people in my newsletter and webinars over the last seven years, and people attend because I talk to them about HIPAA in a way that others don't. Okay, and so yeah, this is sort of like a, a, a kind of uh, sort of a, a righteous indignation now, cut the crap, in that that we really haven't gotten very much further uh, than we were seven years ago because of all the noise out there in the marketplace, right? And we're trying to we're trying to get some signal because although Although something like Security Rule is a monster, we can teach you how to hug that monster in a really, really cost-effective way. And you pay us for by profit and loss center. So if you have one P&L that has a thousand people, okay, well then you pay us twenty-five hundred dollars. If you're IBM and you got a hundred P&Ls, well then you got to have a hundred licenses, right? But still, if you do the math, it's compelling from a cost of uh, perspective. Uh, from a price point perspective, vis-a-vis -vis what our competitors are doing. One thing I'd like to add to that that you left out, uh, $2,500 for all of our products plus Espresso comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. I don't see any of our competitors offering anything close to that. Actually, I, I saw one, and I'm, th I'm thinking we're starting to move the needle in the marketplace and have other people... Uh, ha have to follow suit because uh, you know there's another vendor uh, will sh should remain nameless that has a dare to compare and um, you know obviously our our uh, that's what this cut the crap is about dare to compare give us 15 minutes of your time we'll show you how far out of compliance you are give us another 15 minutes and we'll show you how much in compliance you could be and then go. Uh, perform that same exercise to the the, the litany of uh, competitors that seem to be emerging now, and you should be a much more well-informed uh, consumer if you go through that exercise. You know, so we started. Or, or I was going to say I was going to point this out real quick about the other vendors. If they say you don't even have to ask them any questions, if they say they're HIPAA compliant, move on. Well, uh, yeah, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not so sure that I'd be that that cavalier about it. I mean, there are some good products out there that there's there's all kinds of different products. There's there's really you know infrastructure products and and those are the guys that tend to say they're HIPAA compliant. They you know they they're they're really high tech. They're network monitoring. There may be they they, they may have uh, all kinds of sort of plumbing that help you comply. So it's not like you just need to write them off. It's just like they're not really, they're helping you with a small subset of the requirements. And, you know, what I'm sort of harping about is don't don't give the illusion that somehow implementing your stuff now makes them HIPAA compliant because you're HIPAA compliant, you know. I mean, the EHR vendors tried that and then probably with a lot of success, ah, oh, don't worry about HIPAA, we got that under control, we're encrypting, blah, 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 well, okay. You're encrypting. That's one of the requirements in, uh, in that's one of the 29 controls in the security rule. What about your disaster recovery plan? You know, what about um, two-factor authentication? What about 
you know, you, how you issue security, what, what about your termination procedures, I mean, on and on. It's clear that an EHR vendor wasn't going to help you with all that, right? So by vendors making that claim, it just causes a lot of confusion, and there's already enough confusion with respect to HIPAA that, that you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't necessarily suggest you should write the vendor off. I just think you need to call them on that and say, well, what do you mean by that? And tell me specifically, tell me which one of the requirements you're helping me, me meet, because that's what it comes down to. Tell me about requirements. I don't want to hear about you help in the abstract, okay? Everybody says that. We're, we help you to comply with HIPAA. Well, okay, what does that mean? It's meaningless unless you can tell me, if I'm a consumer, it's meaningless unless you can tell me which requirements of the three rules Right? Not one rule. What's the requirement of the three rules are you helping me comply with? So we started today's episode with discussing the uh, title of uh, Cut the Crap, but there's a second part of that title which is uh, fairly cryptic, uh, right hook. What does right hook mean in this context? Uh, well, right hook is somehow it's a uh, Gwynism that shouldn't have been in there, but I just decided to leave it in there because it was easier to. Um, there, you know, we've been, as you know, because JT, you participated in some, and Martin has participated in damn near all of them. Debbie's participated in a few of the thousands and thousands of uh, people that we've trained in our webinars every month. Um, and part of the cut the crap is 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 uh, something that came out of a Gary V video, you know, that said, uh, "Look, I'm you know I'm, I I give away my stuff, right? I, I I give away my best ideas. I mean, we weren't hiding the ball. I was telling you how to comply, you know, in our free webinars and newsletters. I wasn't charging you any money for that, right? You could have used anybody." You could use anybody's stuff. We were just saying this is this is the methodology you ought to adapt. You need to be thinking about requirements. You need to have visible demonstrable evidence. You need to think about the compliance continuum and where you are on it. You need to think about how you keep score, etc. Now a lot of that, you know, was ultimately reflected in our products. But the, what the right hook uh, was is or punch to the stomach actually from Gary V. Who uh, those of you that don't know Gary V. Just Google Gary V. E. E. Um, and you'll 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 learn about who he is. Uh, his strategy was, you know, I, I give away my best stuff. That's what I do. Uh, but when I want to sell something, I'm just going to hit you with the right hook or the punch to the stomach. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm just going to come out and and ask you to, if you trust me buy this thing and so that's part of the cut the crap here is dare to compare give us 15 minutes of your time we'll show you how far out of compliance you are 15 more minutes we'll show you how far in compliance you uh, you could be right uh, if if you go with us and you go with uh, espresso so that's the that's the right hook part of the cut the crap is we're you know I'm, I'm, I'm cutting the crap I'm asking you Come look at our stuff, and uh, I believe you'll be amazed by what you find. And we're not going to take hours of your time uh, to do it. Plus, we have the 100% uh, money back guarantee. So if you trust what I've been saying over the last seven years, then trust me, there's a ton of value um, in our product. And I think with that, we should close unless somebody's got something else. I think we're good. Martin? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, T, you good? I'm very good. I think this is a great right. episode. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. This is uh, the latest version of the director's 